Thank you, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. And um, I was really pleased to hear uh, the, the um, long list of things that the State Department uh, has been funding and supporting regarding cultural heritage over the past several years. I, I'm going to nix the first paragraph of my talk, which uh, reiterated those many same things. I think it's really admirable what they're doing and stands in contrast to some previous administrations, and um, kudos for that. And thanks so much to them and John Russell and the other staff at the State Department for being so supportive of our work and all the other initiatives that they fund. Um, but that being said, I did also want to make clear to you guys today that I am not personally myself a State Department employee. I am a tenured professor and my job, well really my duty, is to tell you what I think in a straight and uncensored way. So I'm not really speaking on behalf of anyone other than myself today. My opinions are my own and I'll take the heat for them. And this talk has not been vetted by anyone. So. Uh, you can s send all of your blame my way, uh, I guess. Um, I was asked to give this talk because I'm one of the co-directors of this ASOR project that we've been mentioning already. My role in that project is primarily to um, oversee the use of satellite imagery to undertake regional scale analysis of damage to archeological sites and monuments that are happening as a result of the war. And I'm gonna be discussing a lot of that work today. That being said, I also did wanna point out though that there are a lot of other people who could equally be up at this podium at the moment, um, like Amr al Azam, who's speaking this afternoon, and his colleagues, of course, at the Penn Cultural Heritage Center, the Islam al Kuntar and Catherine Hansen, Brian Daniels, and others. Um, they've really been at the forefront of this thing since the beginning. There's also a large group of archeologists, many Europeans, who've put together a group called Shirin, and we'll hear this afternoon from some of them, including uh, uh, Graham Phillip and Jenny Bradbury, Arnold Hauslater from the German Archaeological Institute and others. And of course, there's all my colleagues at ASOR too, including Michael Dante, who spoke at this forum last year, Abdul Razak Moaz, Andy Vaughn, Scott Branting, Leanne Barnes Goodman. I could go on, but my point is that this is a, a big initiative with a lot of people involved, and uh, I think all of them contributing to this global conversation in important ways. Uh, for my part, personally, I, um, you know, this issue is uh, pretty personal. I directed excavations in Western Syria at the ASOR sponsored actually excavations at a site called Tel Karkur uh, for about seven years up until the start of the war. Um, and, you know, I had many close friends there and colleagues. Um, and I really loved the place deeply. Uh, I also served for many years as the chair of ASOR's Damascus Committee, which sounds important, but really is a committee that had no uh, money or responsibilities. So it was more of a um, yearly lunch club where we would get together and talk about what was going on in Syria and gossip about things that had happened and kind of just keep in touch with each other. Um, it was a nice time to meet up, but when the war started in 2011, um, I, like many of my colleagues there, was planning uh, a field season that summer. I had 20 people lined up with plane tickets all ready to go, um, and we all had to cancel, of course. And at our 2011 meeting uh, in November of that year, the Damascus Committee, you know, it was a sad and confused event, and people weren't sure you know, what was coming next. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to take you through the history briefly of my experience, I guess, in uh, the, the war and what it's meant for archeology span in that region. Um, over the next year, through about mid-2012, the reports started to emerge largely in media um, about the really terrible damage that was happening to some of Syria's signature attractions. This was particularly true in Aleppo with the burning of the souk and the destruction of the medieval minaret in the Umayyad Mosque and other events like that. Um, the thing was that there was very little reliable information coming out because most of it was being reported by journalists or on social media. It was a war zone and one that didn't offer access to heritage officials or archeologists at all. So it was kind of a black hole of information. Uh, there were, um, at that same time, started to be reports of intense fighting 
at the Roman city of Apamea. Uh, there was also damage to many of the surrounding late Roman ruins that are known as the dead cities in that region as people fled conflict zones and took refuge in those um, ruins. Apamea was incidentally a site that I happen to know pretty well because it was only about an hour from Karkur and so I visited it with a gaggle of students every summer at least once. Um, it was always a highlight to see this beautiful colonnaded street and its fortified citadel and other monuments. But um, later in 2012, an image was posted on Google Earth. Uh, and this image here, you can see the layout of the site as it appeared in July 2011. This was prior to any serious damage. Um, then, uh, just nine months later, uh, a, this huge area of the site was transformed into a pockmarked lunar landscape uh, by looting holes. So I'm going to zoom in here to this area of the colonnaded street, where you can see here how it looked in 2011, and then here um, just uh, nine months later. Um, and these looting holes that you see across this are not small. You know, zooming in, you can see they're really big, two to three meters across, and you know, hundreds of them. The sheer number suggests that it was a pretty big operation, probably involving a large labor force and heavy machinery and so forth. Um, the looting that was revealed on the imagery got a fair amount of media attention, but when I saw it, what, um, what I saw was strange and perplexing, I thought, and that was because looting, in this case, was taking place really exclusively on the government-owned heritage portion of the site. The western side of the site was privately held and cultivated, and the looting followed that line exactly along the road, which was hard to explain. Over the following months, um, looting continued to expand on the site. Um, seen here then, that following September in 2012, as there's additional looting now encroaching onto the private fields in the north, and then again in 2013, as um, looting uh, sort of proceeded along ancient urban blocks in this kind of remarkably well-ordered way. Um, and at the same time, the site was under Syrian military occupation. Uh, and that was most clearly evident in the construction of a large garrison at the southern end of the site sometime prior to September 2012 um, around the former tourist restaurant where they bulldozed an earthen wall and built two tank platforms. Um, looking at Apamea as a case, my immediate question was, well, how widespread is this kind of looting in Syria? Like, is this case exceptional? Is it common? And so then, later that year, in 2012, at the Damascus Committee meeting in November, which felt like a wake, frankly, I was talking to Lisa Cooper, and I, I said, what if we just get a bunch of satellite imagery so that we can at least monitor what's going on? And, and she said, you should do that. And so I said, well, okay, let's see what we can do. So the, over the next nine months or so, I decided to do a pilot study, um, and I was basically trying to do it with primarily free sources of imagery that were available on Google Earth or Bing Maps or other image mapping services like that. But there was really very little coverage for Syria available that postdated the war. Um, and buying imagery from the private companies like Digital Globe that sell it is really quite expensive, costing something like 40 to $50 per square kilometer. And so kind of cost prohibitive to do a, a big study across lots of Syria. I wrote a few proposals. Eventually, I got an imagery grant in October of 2013 from the Digital Globe Foundation. They just offered about 25 scenes that allowed us to cover um, about 30 major archaeological sites. I picked out sites from the many thousands that are in Syria, selecting like more or less A-list sites, um, plus Tel Karkor, of different periods. <laughs> um, in different regions of Syria. And then I, I used um, these images alongside freely available imagery to do a pilot study, which was fairly revealing in a number of ways. For example, here at the site of Tel Jafar, which is just a small mound about two and a half kilometers east of Apamea, we also saw a similar and disturbing trend in which um, there were looting holes at the site that were found, again, in association with Syrian military occupation. This image is from the site in April 2012. And you can see that the top of the mound has been badly bulldozed. There are also military tents at the base of the mound. 
and archaeological sites in the nearest family commonly, of course, form these prominent mounds. They're naturally strategic points in the landscape oftentimes, which is why they were occupied as long as they were. And they um, often then become the site of military occupation during conflicts. Uh, anyway, in this case, the entire base of the mound had been severely looting. Uh, but we can look back and see actually that the looting in this case began well prior to the war with smaller looting holes dating back here in 2007 and actually as early as 2003. But the 2012 looting holes uh, that are associated with the military occupation of the site are much larger and actually located just a few meters outside of the military tents. So suggesting, again, um, a lot of effort and a close association of those things. Um, even my own site at Tel Karkor was bulldozed as this early phase of the war. In this image um, from June of 2010, this was actually one of my favorites because it was taken while we were on the site. I know that because I can see our bus and our excavation trenches, and I'm sure I'm in this picture too, if you zoomed in close enough. Um, but in the summer of 2011, just after the conflict started, the top of the lower mound, um, just outside of our excavation areas, uh, was bulldozed and again became a sort of tank garrison. Um, I learned uh, actually just this past summer from our friends who lived in the adjacent village um, that when the military occupied Tel Karkor at this time, they actually forced the entire community to leave their homes and they've been living as internal refugees ever since um, somewhere on the Turkish border. Um, anyway, I and my grad student Mitra Panahipur uh, published this study in the spring of 2014 and that was right about the same time that the Department of State put out their car for proposals. Our team at ASOR was awarded that cooperative agreement and that was when we got started on this new project in the summer of 2014. Um, uh, that summer was actually just about the same time when ISIL was becoming a much greater threat and a bigger player in the war. Like many archaeologists who were formerly working in Syria, I had recently begun a new field project in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, which had opened up to archaeological research in a big new way and was very welcoming to foreign archaeologists coming in. I had just finished up the field season and was in Erbil visiting Glenn Schwartz in June of 2014 when um, ISIL invaded and seized Mosul, which was just about an hour away. Uh, and soon afterwards, there was widespread media coverage of the um, intentional demolition of the tomb of Jonah, or what's known as Nebi Yunus. Um, the tomb was a Shiite shrine. It was built on top of a mound uh, that was actually within the ancient Neo-Assyrian city of Nineveh, just on the eastern side of the Tigris River, adjacent to Mosul. Uh, the ancient walls and other features of the city appear quite clearly on this corona image from 1968. Uh, today, the site in Nebi Yunus are basically within the sprawling city of Mosul. Um, you'll recall that Jonah was uh, trying to uh, avoid going to Nineveh when he got swallowed by that great fish. And um, the tomb marks the traditional location of his final resting place. And so the site was re revered by uh, Shiite Muslims. The tomb um, was destroyed. Um, this is the tomb there. Uh, anyway, the, the, this tomb was destroyed in ISIS, by, by ISIL in uh, July of 2014 and uh, was posted to social media in a video, uh, probably, probably because this shrine happened to be dedicated to someone who we in the West had heard of and revered ourselves, that is Jonah, media coverage of this destruction went pretty viral. But in fact, um, the work of my ASOR colleague, Mike Dante, showed pretty well that um, ISIL had been systematically demolishing shrines and other religious sites that they regarded as heretical for at least a year, uh, producing these kinds of scripted videos and posting them online. Um, Nebi Yunus is the one that really got the media's attention because this was Jonah, but um, this was part of a long and ongoing trend uh, destroying hundreds of such sites throughout the region. Uh, you can read all about Mike's work in the most recent issue of Near Eastern Archaeology where he has a paper discussing it and where I pulled this chart from. Um, anyway, it was soon after this, um, in September of 2014, uh, when the State Department organized uh, the first of their events at the Met, which I was super excited to attend because, you know, it was 
at the Met with the cocktail party and John Kerry. Anyway, after a brief talk by Mike Dante about our project, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, got up and gave a speech um, directly linking the antiquities crisis to a call for action and pointing the finger directly at ISIL as the key problem. I was hoping I'd get a chance to meet him at the reception that followed, just because celebrity, you know. But um, I, he darted out of the room right after his speech, and later I learned why, I assumed, because it was that night, actually, that the US military began its air campaign against ISIL targets in Syria and, and Iraq. Um, so over the past year, of course, ISIL has engaged then in many other high-profile acts of antiquities carnage, or what my friend Omar Hamanshah uh, calls spectacles of destruction. He has a paper about this again in that NEA issue from September. Um, in February 2014, they released a video showing the intentional demolition of statuary in the Mosul Museum, uh, much of it originally from the Roman site of Hatra, not far away, and some of it probably replicas. Um, they also showed the intentional destruction of neo-Assyrian lamassus and the gates of Nineveh just across the river. These videos were, of course, designed to shock and horrify us um, and to raise the profile of ISIL among its potential recruits. And they really probably succeeded in, booth, in both as um, global media uh, went pretty nuts reporting on this. Um, so ISIL responded by next targeting the neo-Assyrian city of Nimrud, which is just a little ways south on the Tigris River. Um, this was the site that was the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 9th century BC, uh, famously excavated by Austin Henry Layard in the 1840s. Um, that excavation, goes without saying, produced all kinds of relief panels and statuaries that adorn museums around the world, at the British Museum, at the Metropolitan, and of course at Dartmouth's Hood Museum, um, where I am now, to name a few. Most of these monumental artworks came from the palace of Ashurnasirpal, the so-called Northwest Palace on the high mound of Nimrud. Um, in April of 2015, ISIL then released another video showing the interior of the extant Northwest Palace where there were still some reliefs remaining uh, that Laird didn't remove, being prepared for demolition with these large bombs inside of barrels. Um, these images, incidentally, come from one of several excellent and very detailed reports by my colleagues at the ASOR project. They're all available on the project website, and I encourage you to go there, and if you want to read something depressing, take a look at them, but they go through everything we know about what happened in some detail. Anyway, following this, it, um, the palace was detonated in a massive explosion. And um, our team then at ASOR in that report used satellite imagery to verify the destruction, thanks to Scott Branching and his crew for doing this. In uh, this sequence of images, we can see the site with really no visible damage in February, followed by several walls having been bulldozed, um, presumably in preparation for the demolition in an image from April 1st, and then uh, the palace largely demolished by April 17th. Um, most recently, uh, you might have heard, of course, that ISIL had moved on to Palmyra, which um, had been the site of conflict since early in the war, but came under full ISIL control this past July. As uh, in August, they began releasing videos of similar attempts to mine and demolish the exquisite monumental remains at Palmyra. And again, I I'd point you to the detailed reports on this done by my ASOR colleagues that are on the website. Um, ISIL showed um, people destroying statuary with sledgehammers. They illustrated the demolition of shrines and several of the famed tower tombs at the site, and um, as well as the destruction of some of the signature monuments at Palmyra, like the Baal Shamin Temple here, the Temple of Baal, the Triumphal Arch at the center of the site. They also, of course, executed the elderly and much beloved archaeologist Khalid al-Assad who uh, purportedly because he had refused to reveal the location of hidden antiquities at the site. Clearly these guys are um, brutal thugs and um, they're using these acts to elicit outrage from us and to bring themselves attention. Uh, this is a strategy that has really worked well for them I suppose such that in the past year Coverage of the antiquities crisis has 
uh, come to focus almost entirely on ISIL in the media. Um, so a alongside these stories about the demolitions, though, there have been continuing reporting on looting of antiquities, uh, suggesting that ISIL, as Andrew was talking about earlier, had been using the sale of antiquities to fund their operations. Um, there wasn't much evidence about the antiquities trade itself available until recently. Um, and, um, but that case and the evidence for it was really made most explicit, as Andrew mentioned, at that Department of State organized event at the Met just this past September. Um, at the thing, Andrew Keller, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions, I had to look up that title. Anyway, he, um, like he said, revealed a number of these documents that had been um, uh, acquired in that raid. I've reproduced one of the documents here on the slide, but they have usefully put all of them online at the State Department website, um, the link below, where you can see the actual documents and the translations of them and analysis, as well as a text of um, Secretary Keller's speech. Um, so uh, uh, this document, for instance, is one of the ones that shows ISIL had organized the Department of Antiquities and that they're taxing the proceeds of looting, but also instituting punishments for people who loot without a permit. Um, so let me be clear here, this is a perverse and horrible thing to do, another in the long list of terrible things that ISIL has done uh, that are unbelievably atrocious. Um, the extreme actions by ISIL have really led to understandable outrage across the globe. Uh, but um, I think that our focus on ISIL has also led to some misunderstandings about the, the scope of the antiquities crisis in the region and about who's responsible and therefore also about how best to address it. Um, looting and antiquity smuggling, as well as a huge amount of heritage destruction are rampant across Syria, both inside and outside of ISIL areas, and it was a giant problem before ISIL entered, existed, the, you know, or entered the war. Um, so, as with any of the issues related to this war, whether we're talking about this or about the horrific attacks in Paris, um, I think that we need to try to grapple with the complexity of the situation in order to respond to it in an appropriate way. But um, media coverage has really instead taken a pretty sensational tone, framing ISIL, um, where there, ISIL is regarded as kind of the exclusive cause of the antiquities crisis in Syria, and something that plays perfectly actually into how they want to be seen. Um, for example, there was a widely viewed CBS story in September, which was actually also aired at that Met event, in which an investigative journalist um, managed to find a, a black market antiquities dealer in Istanbul who claimed to be selling antiquities from Syria. The dealer tried to fence her and Amr al-Azam this uh, late Roman mosaic for $100,000, which he claimed came from Apamea. And that was a, a very interesting investigative part of the story and I think a valuable contribution. But the headline of the story online and here in this screen clip um, said, ISIS looted antiquities appearing on black market. So like, first of all, we have no idea whether this mosaic actually came from Apamea because there are hundreds of other late Roman sites that have been looted. It's plausible, of course, as an origin, both stylistically speaking and because Apamea was so severely looted. The problem, which I thought CBS should know, however, is that Apamea is far outside of territory in which ISIL has ever been active. And most of Apamea was looted in 2012, long before ISIS was a major player in the war, and seems to have been done under the watch of or adjacent to the Syrian military. So not an ISIS looted object, I would say. This association of like ISIL as, and, and, and the antiquities crisis has proven really hard to dislodge. Last month, the Daily Beast broke a story in which the Green family, who owns the Oklahoma-based Hobby Lobby chain, was being investigated for illegally smuggling into the U.S. a collection of 200 probably looted cuneiform tablets. Uh, they were destined to be put on display in a planned museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Um, and reporting on this issue, as here in the New Republic, has frequently linked the tablets to ISIL looting, never mind the fact 
that they were seized in Memphis in 2011, and so must have been looted a long time before the war in Syria even began, most likely coming from somewhere in southern Iraq, where Elizabeth Stone has shown there was an extraordinary amount of looting, especially during the mid-2000s after the 2003 invasion. So uh, my point, I just want to be clear that um, there are a lot of looted artifacts coming out of this war zone, and some of those might have been looted by people who paid a tax to ISIL, and some of them might have been looted by ISIL, and some might have been looted by the Syrian military, and a lot are being looted probably by random Syrian people who are just trying to feed their families. Um, ISIL are a horrible group of brutal thugs. There's no question about that. And the damage they've caused to antiquities in Syria and Iraq is uniquely bad in many respects. Um, in the same way that their abuse of people is perverse and horrific. Um, but there were also horrific things happening to the Syrian people long before ISIL became a major player in this war. I mean, recall that the Obama administration nearly launched missile strikes against the Assad regime in 2012 following the purported use of chemical weapons against their own citizens. Um, and we've also seen devastation of antiquities caused by conflict and looting across all parts of Syria since the beginning of the war. My point is that if we want to come up with strategies to address the cultural heritage crisis, as with any of the other humanitarian issues in this war, we need to fully understand the complex dimensions of the problem. And we shouldn't just operate in a sort of simplified caricature of it, even if it happens to be a politically expedient caricature. Um, so with that goal in mind, I and the other people at ASOR's Cultural Heritage Initiative have been working throughout this very strange and sad year in to the best way that I can, a dispassionate approach to systematically try and document damage to sites and monuments. And so what I want to do now is shift um, to share how I've tried to approach that issue and show you some of our results to date. Um, you'll recall that in my pilot project, the main limiting factor for assessing damage to sites was imagery availability. Um, in our proposal to the State Department, um, a year and a half ago, I had actually suggested that we perform an analysis on 400 sites, which would have been 10 times the number that we had done before. But that was imagining I'd have to purchase all of the imagery. Uh, soon after the project started, a little over a year ago, our colleagues at State were able to get us access to the entire archive of satellite imagery collected by this company, Digital Globe. They're a private company who operates several satellites that collect the high resolution imagery that populates Google and Bing Maps on your phones. Um, but it, in fact, most of their business, something like 90% of it, actually comes from the Department of Defense. And because of that, other branches of the federal government and people working with them like we are can get access to this imagery database. Uh, these satellites are constantly collecting imagery such that new data is available for Syria and Iraq on a nearly daily basis. And so suddenly our goals shifted as we were faced with a, a very different problem, just a deluge of imagery, more than we could really possibly analyze. And so instead it turned into a problem of how to sample this data set. Um, as, as part of a NASA-funded project that I'd begun in 2010, the uh, NASA has a space archaeology program that sometimes fund imagery-based archaeological research. Um, anyway, I had already developed a pretty comprehensive archaeological site database for Syria and surrounding regions. Uh, this is hard, it turns out, because the large majority of archaeological sites in this part of the world have never actually even been documented. Um, so what we did in that project was uh, to start by first mapping all of the published sites. And those included everything that's been excavated, everything that had been published in archaeological survey reports, like this one from the Quake River Valley north of Aleppo, where we uh, basically geo-reference the published maps and then use uh, satellite imagery to plot the locations of each site. Um, this uh, produced a data set of around uh, 4,100 known sites for northern Syria and surrounding regions. Um, the dense clusters you see on this slide are essentially where archaeologists have looked for sites. Uh, the blank areas between them are pretty much undocumented or unpublished, and so when we turn to satellite imagery then, we can like fill in these gaps. Um, systematically then going through this entire region, uh, mapping undocumented sites from satellite imagery, we've added something like 10,000 or so sites to that data set, and it continues to grow. And so it's this database that serves as the real basis for our monitoring efforts, um, you know, because knowing where the sites are is something, and whatever we can about them is really essential. 
Uh, so then we incorporate it into this data set, which is really primarily archaeological sites, uh, then an additional maybe 650 or so museums and historic buildings and other monuments, although um, those are features that are often the most difficult to monitor from space. Um, anyway, from this we then um, created a system um, through AGIS that enables us to view the digital globe imagery uh, directly in our site database. This operates through ArcGIS. Um, and then uh, we can log information about damage into a central database that can subsequently be queried. Um, analyzing sites for damage like this takes some time and it has to be done by somebody who's well trained. So we uh, created a sample of sites from the overall database of around um, 1,450. These included uh, 650 uh, priority sites um, that are, are basically uh, every site that had been excavated or that a tourist would want to visit. Then there was another 700 sites that were surveyed by archaeologists, but not otherwise well known. And then about 100 or so sites that we had mapped only from imagery that were used to fill in sort of areas with poor survey coverage. Um, for each of these sites within this sample, uh, we then developed a damage assessment protocol um, in which uh, we record a wide range of uh, damage. We record uh, who is making the observation and when, uh, the date of pre- and post-war images being compiled, um, and uh, uh, also other kinds of damage fields. So we look at looting, classifying it in terms of ma minor, moderate, or severe looting, um, and then we record all kinds of other forms of damage, uh, bulldozing or construction, the presence of military garrisons, and other aspects. Uh, we also note if sites are not visible or if there's inadequate imagery for that region or if there is ground cover like forest or other things that make it impossible to assess things like looting or other damage. Uh, using, approaching it this way, we can then query the data set to ask questions. Like we can ask whether, for example, war-related looting is more common at sites of particular periods. We can look at whether looting is um, more common in certain geographic regions. We can look for other kinds of temporal patterns in various kinds of site damage or the correspondence of different kinds of damage. Um, so at the end of the first year, we had um, completed uh, comprehensive assessments, about 1,289 sites that were able to make those calculations for some of the original 1450 we exclude because of their visibility or imagery availability or other things. Anyway, um, these sites are located across all parts of Syria. They're concentrated in some areas more than others because of where imagery was available. But um, basically what I just want to do quickly now is share with you a few general observations that we can make from this sample of the sites in Syria. Um, so first of all, um, there were a lot of sites in our sample, say maybe more than 20%, up maybe 23, 24% that show signs of looting prior to the beginning of the war. Uh, some of these, like the Roman fortress at Rasafa that's pictured here, it looks like it's been looted every weekend for the past several decades. I mean, the age of pre-war looting is really hard to determine, but what we're able to show is that um, on the earliest available high resolution commercial imagery that's from about 12 years ago, oftentimes all of the looting holes are still present. And in a few cases, we can map looting holes on 1960s corona imagery that are still visible today. And so that suggests to me that the record of pre-war looting that we're mapping basically documents all looting over at least a period of several decades, all sort of compressed together into one. Um, so uh, both prior to and since the war, uh, the large majority of looting that we see is something that we classify as minor. This means that we see something like less than 15 or so holes on a site. Um, however, uh, since the war, what we've seen is a huge spike in the frequency of looting incidents, something like an order of magnitude over pre-war looting levels. Um, Looting was illegal in Syria prior to the war, and the penalties could be quite severe. Uh, like, you could go to jail if you got caught. So as long as there's a functioning civil authority, um, looting had to be done in secret, in remote areas or at night or quietly. Um, with the breakdown of civil authority uh, since the start of the war, people are much more free to loot at will. And this has led, as it always does in antiquities-rich conflict zones, 
to a massive increase in looting. We saw the same thing in Iraq after 2003, and the same thing's happening now in Libya and Afghanistan and Yemen, to name a few. Um, sometimes uh, we can see that what began as minor looting as here at the um, ancient site of uh, Chalcis or Kinnisreen in western Syria. Um, this is the site as it appeared in 2011 where you can see some minor pre-war looting, a few holes on the high mound of the site. Um, that uh, looting has gradually expanded over the years since the war, so that in this October 2014 image there are many more holes. And this is just an example of a general trend that we often see, which is uh, an increase in rates of looting at all kinds of sites. Um, and that's really something to be expected in the context of war. Uh, more concerning are episodes of more severe looting, especially those that take place over shorter periods of time and thus appear maybe more of a top-down operation, like we saw at the start of the war at Apamea. Uh, in recent years, we've seen a, a serious uptick in this kind of looting, particularly in ISIL-held areas at quite a number of significant sites, such as here at Dura Europus. Uh, Dura is a huge Hellenistic and Roman city um, built on a bluff above the Euphrates River in eastern Syria. Um, it's most famous for its well-preserved frescoes, um, which ironically and sadly were first discovered when British military bunkers were dug on the site during the 1922 Arab Revolt. Uh, this image from uh, 2011 shows a, a huge amount of looting on the site actually um, uh, prior to the war, uh, particularly in the area outside the Palmyrene Gate. Um, since the war though, uh, since the area of Dura was taken by ISIL forces, the site has been devastatingly looted, though, inside and outside the city walls. The black spots on this image um, that you see from here to here um, are mostly looting holes. Uh, we can zoom in a little bit here to the area of the Palmyrene Gate to see a better example of what we're talking about. So there's the gateway. Now, outside of it, there are dozens and dozens of looting holes that predate the war in this 2011 image. It is up to 2015. We now see many more looting holes. In this case, looting holes dug inside of looting holes. I don't think they probably found very much. But Anyway, at um, the site of Mari, we also see um, a similar process. Uh, the site, this is uh, down on the Euphrates River near the Iraqi border, another site that needs no introduction to most Near Eastern archaeologists. It's been the location of major French excavation since the 1930s. It's produced an extraordinary array of Bronze Age finds, and most famously the remains of a palatial complex of King Zimmerlin from the early second millennium BC. Um, looting at the site uh, began before ISIL took the region in which it's located, and there were reports that armed gangs who occupied it were actually demanding protection money from the French in exchange for not looting it. Since the region has come under ISIS control, though, uh, looting has become quite severe across the high mound um, surrounding the, the palace of Zimrilim, as you can see in this uh, 2015 image. Um, there are a, a lot of other instances of looting in ISIL-held areas that are frankly quite bizarre. Um, this uh, one we see that's uh, uniquely is the whole-scale removal of soil from the site. Uh, this example is Telbia, located uh, just outside the ISIL stronghold of Raqqa. Uh, Telbia is, is best known and loved to Near Eastern archaeologists for its Bronze Age palatial buildings, but it also has a small area of late Roman and early medieval occupation on its southwestern tip. And that area had actually been intensively looted for decades before the war. It's quite common for looters to target Roman and late Roman sites preferentially, probably, for what they find there. In any case, we did not um, see much new looting at Telbia for the first few years of the war until suddenly in 2014, when a couple of new holes appeared on these old looted parts of the site, after which huge portions of the mound were removed en masse. Um, so this could be evidence of people trying to um, maybe evade ISIL authorities or to avoid the tax that they purportedly place on antiquities whereby they could take the soil elsewhere using heavy machinery and then sort it, but uh, who knows? I mean, that would just be a, a guess. Um, so uh, this, of course, is, uh, uh, but I think it's important to emphasize um, that these kinds of cases of severe and sort of more organized looting operations 
while most common in ISIL held areas, are not unique to them. Uh, at the beginning, I showed several examples from Western Syria where uh, looting was closely associated with Syrian military activities, and that has unfortunately also seemed to continue. One of the best examples is from the site of um, Ebla, modern Tel Mardik, another one of the sort of A-list Bronze Age sites of Syria, excavated since the 50s by an Italian team and produced an extraordinary wealth of artifacts. Um, and a large cuneiform archive, of course. In the first year of the war, there was no evidence of damage to the site visible on satellite imagery, although there were Syrian government reports of illegally digging in the Bronze Age palatial complex. Um, then in November of 2012, uh, we could see what appeared to be a new military encampment inside the city walls, um, presumably because they form earthen mounds about 20 meters high. Over the next year and a half, Syrian military activity expanded on the site considerably with numerous new compounds constructed probably to house artillery installations. And at the same time, the site has been severely looted with new looting holes dug across the site, especially uh, surrounding the citadel in the center, often right outside these um, military bunkers. Uh, I just want to turn now to a few broader patterns that we can see in our data to close. One question that I've tried to answer is um, whether looting is more common in isolated held areas than it is in other parts of Syria. And this turns out to be really quite a complex question. Uh, we do our best though. So for this analysis, we uh, rely on map data for territorial control that's produced by the Strategic Needs Analysis Project, or SNAP. That's an organization that does excellent work really in tracking the humanitarian crisis in Syria. And since 2013, they've produced quarterly reports showing detailed maps of territorial control. Um, here you can see all of the sites we've analyzed um, plotted against a simplified map of territorial control as of early 2015 that is mainly correspondent to about when most of our sites have been analyzed. Um, so uh, querying this database then for only sites where we can definitively say they were looted during the war um, we can plot them then all on the map here. And what you can see, uh, first of all, is um, a concentration of severe looting at like a lot of the sites that we've looked at, at Apamea, and Ebla, and Kinnisreen, Bia, Dori Europas, and Mari. Um, the apparent absence of looting in southern Syria is mostly probably a result of poor survey coverage in that area that results in a much smaller sample. But we can look at these data then and produce some statistics from it so if we were to consider the number of looted sites, for example, in different areas of factional control as a percentage of the total sites that we've assessed for each region, we can see some interesting trends. Uh, first of all, it's quite evident that overall incidents of looting are much higher in Kurdish and opposition-held areas than either in Syrian regime or ISIL areas. Uh, this, uh, most of this, the large majority of those, are, are really minor looting incidents. And that accords well with the notion that looting happens most commonly in the absence of civil authority, um, because these are the most anarchic regions of Syria. Um, the enforcement of antiquities policies, whether uh, like sensible ones like coming from Damascus or, or perverse ones like those coming from Raqqa, seem to both have a similar effect on reducing the overall rate of looting. Um, however, we can also see in these data a disturbingly high percentage, in this case, 42% um, in change, of moderate and severe looting in ISIL-held areas. And we really could read this as evidence of probably more organized and potentially state-sanctioned looting as the documents uh, captured in the raid suggest to exist. Um, another bigger question that we're also trying to address right now is uh, when looting is occurring and whether the rate of looting incidents has changed over the past few years. Uh, this also turns out to be a pretty complicated question to answer, uh, mainly because in order to know when episodes of looting take place, what we need to do is kind of sandwich them between the dates of available satellite imagery. Um, some sites get imaged a lot, especially if they happen to be in hot conflict zones, while others might be just have two images. So the best we can say is that looting took place within like a four-year window. This chart um, summarizes our ability to assess when looting has occurred with short bars indicated for sites um, where we can be quite precise about when and long bars for less so. And thanks to Elise Laugier in the back for putting this and the next slide together. Um, so on this, then we perform a basic analysis where we 
uh, weight the likelihood of looting occurring in any given month um, uh, or a quarter. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, so uh, for example, if a site was looted at some time within a 10 month window, then we would give it a 10% likelihood of having been looted in any of those months. Um, so evaluating all of the sites that have been looted during the war in this way, we get what's essentially a straight line. And what that suggests is that the overall rate of looting has remained steady throughout the war. Um, th this rate is, remember, something like an order of magnitude higher than pre-war levels. So what that supports is, first of all, our understanding of looting as being linked primarily to the absence of civil authority. When the war started, looting increased, and since the war has gone on, it has continued at that same rate. Um, so that is a depressing fact, but true, uh, as far as I can tell. And this is the kind of work that we're going to be continuing to do over the next year, uh, analyzing more sites, expanding our coverage and our sample, updating these sites, and performing more of this kind of, I think, basic analysis of, of the situation. Um, a lot of times I get asked uh, why I'm doing this. Uh, and to be honest, like, I'm not always sure like, um, what the appropriate response should be during an unprecedented crisis like this one. Um, the World Monuments Fund a few weeks ago released their biannual watch list of heritage sites in peril, which included no mention of Syria, Iraq, or other war zones. Um, instead, they simply had the unnamed monument that didn't say what that was or where. The leadership at WWF explains this as them not wanting to simply serve as a mouthpiece for ISIL propaganda, not wanting to give them the media attention they crave. Uh, and I understand that entirely, but my question is, does that mean that we should like say and do nothing? Um, so I mean, I think that there is some things we can do, and one is to do the kind of steady work of documentation that I and my colleagues at ASOR, our colleagues at Sheeran, at Penn, and other groups elsewhere are engaged in. Um, the, the other thing we can do is address the demand side of this equation. Uh, there are a lot of looted antiquities showing up on the market, and, they, and there's been a really increased um, focus on uh, uh, police and customs enforcement. Uh, uh, but um, what a lot of non-specialists don't understand is that recovering these objects after they have been looted is really not very helpful, because once objects are removed from the ground, they lose almost all of their analytic value. Archaeology is a lot like crime scene investigation, as I tell my undergrads, but in the ancient past, police rely on careful analysis of like where a knife is and the patterns of blood splatter on the wall and the footprints on the carpet and the fingerprints. And if you just show up at a police station and hand them a random knife, they won't be interested in it. But like maybe it was used in a murder or maybe you got it from your kitchen. You know, like um, what is important is context. So, Artifacts are the same way. Without their context, they're just pretty, or probably more often not so pretty baubles. Um, so, I mean, there's not really much we can do to address the situation inside Syria and Iraq until the war ends, but there are things we can do here. So the, the looting is taking place in large part because there's a market for it, and that is something we can address, like now and today. I think that the efforts that Andrew was talking about earlier are important. But, you know, there's a lot of other things that can happen. Like, think about elephant ivory. Um, uh, right now, under rules that were just revised last year in the U.S., it's illegal to buy, sell, trade, or import elephant ivory. And we do this specifically because we know that if we allow the sale of ivory, even old ivory, it will encourage elephants to be illegally killed to supply that market. And we can do the same thing with antiquities, like right now here in America. So, I mean, we should probably institute a similar moratorium on buying, selling, or trading Near Eastern antiquities, all of them. Like, um, and we should encourage other states to do the same. Uh, they shouldn't be for sale on eBay, they shouldn't be in auction houses, and that is my firm belief. Um, we should make it illegal to import them into the US, even if they are legally acquired abroad, in the same way that we do for ivory, or for conflict zone diamonds, or human body parts. And what that will do is dramatically undercut the market for antiquities. And as middlemen have more difficulty in moving what must be huge warehouses filled with objects, they'll probably be less likely to buy more, and that'll probably have an impact in looting in the war zone. But that's just my suggestion. Anyway, um, that's really the end of my talk. And I just want to say thank you all for coming. 
And um, here's a photo to leave you out from happier times in Syria. So thank you. <laughs>